Hey, what's up? Welcome to episode 44 of the Making It in Nashville podcast. This episode is a thrill ride. You're going to get 11s out of 10 for the majority of the entire episode. Um, but before we get into all that, let's start with a sound bite from our guest, Philip Cooper. So this program is called Upskill Western North Carolina. And when it was created, um, the role that I had, it was a part-time role. It was 29 hours a week. And it was supposed to serve uh, low-level nonviolent offenders and people with food stamps, SNAP benefits. And um, so I had 29 hours a week, and um, I was to get the numbers up at uh, NC Work, as well as get people who are receiving food stamps to get certain trainings and come out of poverty, get livable wage jobs and come out of poverty. Um, in that role, that 29-hour-a-week role, uh, what I ran into was me not being able to just focus on low-level nonviolent offenders. You know, my story is I, I did prison time myself. Prison saved my life. I w I'm not um, I, I wasn't a low level nonviolent offender, but like um, prison saved my life. So I'm real passionate about helping those people who are returning from prison uh, and they have that gift of desperation. Like they just want a shot. They want to make it. They don't ever want to go back. So in that role, I'm working in the courthouse. And I'm running into people, people I grew up with, people I know, and they seeing me in this role and they're like, can you help, 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 help. So it was hard for me to just focus on low level nonviolent. Right. For one, the charges I had, I didn't even qualify for food stamps. There are many people who are returning from incarceration that can't get food assistance because of certain felonies that they have. They are indefinitely disqualified from receiving those benefits. That is a North Carolina thing. There have been some states who made some adjustments, and we did make some adjustments in North Carolina. However, um, the modifications was to permit certain lower level felonies to be able to get it. So in that role, I'm running into people that are all disqualified from receiving my services and they're asking me for help. So I had to do something about it. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Making It in Asheville, a podcast where you get to hear the stories behind some of your favorite artists and businesses in town. Each episode, we interview a local Ashevillian to uncover how they are making it in Asheville and provide you with actionable insights from each conversation. And we are your hosts. That was Sarah and I am Tony. We are a husband and wife team based out of Asheville. We moved here last year, May 2019, uh, and we set out to answer a single question. That question was, how are we going to make it in Asheville? And so we decided to interview people who, by our own judgments, are making it in Asheville. Those people look like artists, entrepreneurs, um, multi-job havers, uh, aspiring artists and entrepreneurs. And in this episode specifically, uh, we get to talk with Philip Cooper, who identifies as a change agent. We'll get into that in just a moment. Just a reminder that this podcast is powered by our very own marketing business called Making It Creative. We help passionate business owners develop meaningful storytelling and marketing strategies to grow and more effectively convert their audience into customers. If you want to learn more, visit makingitcreative.com. How was that ad? I loved it. I, <laughs> so we are, um, thank you for bearing with us while we do that. It is. Uh, it takes a ton of work to put out these episodes and we're trying new and more exciting things like videos on YouTube. And so um, thank you for allowing us to try to put out ads that are hopefully meaningful. And if you are working uh, on a project or have a business here in Asheville and like the content and, and stories that we're putting out, we'd love to talk to you about it. And you can talk to us with that as the intent at makingitcreative.com. Wonderful, Sarah. Um, let's now, dive in. Yeah, now let's talk about the good stuff, the particularly great stuff Philip Cooper, change agent, that, those two hours, I think about all the time. I, we, so this, this conversation is um, uh, un, at an energy level, unlike any episode so far. Does that, I mean, that's, does that feel safe to oh, say? Oh, yeah. I mean, Philip Cooper is like, he's in it, man. He's in he it. is. He's all in. He, yeah. His heart and his energy um, are overflowing. I have, we have a mentor, uh, from back in New York and one of his things was like, um, 
the cup is not full, it's overflowing. And when I overflow with energy, when I overflow with enthusiasm and possibility, like the good things that happen around me are contagious. And that is how I feel about Philip here in town. Um, you will get a sense really quickly uh, uh, just how connected mm -hmm. Philip is. And the reason that I think he is as connected as he is, is because it is so clear that his intention is service. His intention is to uh, support the people around him. And there's this, oh my God, there's this uh, moment in uh, one of the Parks and Recreation episodes where uh, Leslie Nope, one of the main characters, asks for a favor and she gets the favor. And the reasoning from whoever she gets the favor from is, I, Leslie Nope gets unlimited requests mm -hmm. because when she asks for a favor, it's never for her. Mm. it's for someone else. And I, that's the energy I get from Philip. Like if he ever yeah. needs anything, yeah, Philip, I got you a hundred percent. For sure. And a little bit of background about yes, Philip in case you don't know. So, I mean, you'll know from the title that he works for an organization called Upskill WNC and Upskill helps formerly incarcerated and those of lower income families, um, find their way back into the world um, that looks like helping them find jobs, helping them get cars and computers and helping them get sort of reestablished um, in a world that maybe they, they felt left out of or, or lost out of. And Philip himself was uh, formerly in prison. So he knows what it's like to have been there and mm -hmm. to have to get himself out of that. And his mission really is to help others do the same thing and, and stay on a, a path that is, empowering to them absolutely he um he the way the language he uses is that he is he's become a bridge right mm -hmm. he he is connected to resources and he is connected to a community and he feels that it is his responsibility therefore to be the bridge that that um facilitates both sides doing good and uh for the next uh, i'd say 90 minutes or so what you're going to hear is this infectious level of energy and charisma um, that I we are confident that you will uh, want to go out of your way to support or um, in some way encourage. And so uh, the last thing that stands out, and you'll get way more than this from the episode, is the idea of uh, some entrepreneurs, some people who are working, who are afraid of burning out. Sarah, this is something that you, you mentioned has like come up with you a lot. Do you want to talk about the idea of burnout as Philip Cooper sees it? Yeah, I mean, we, we kind of talk about like two different ideas, right? Like one is like you get burnout and then you can't do your work anymore and you're tired and you need a break and you need to change. We've all kind of have maybe experienced that. A lot of people talk about burnout, like that's a kind of buzzword and hot topic mm -hmm. today. Um, and on the other hand, Philip is like, no, you got to just burn the shit down. Yeah, burn. Like, you just got to give it all. You got to do everything that you can do to make it work. And that is going to, you know, maybe re refill you in some sort of way. So we kind of, there's kind of like this weird dichotomy that, that we talk about in this episode. And I think, um, like you said, Philip's energy is infectious. And you'll understand what we mean when you hear the episode. Sure. And the thing that stands out on the dichotomy of uh, the burnout is that when you're not doing work that you're aligned with, you're going to feel burnout in the bad sense. You're going sure. to you're going to get tired of it. It's not going to be enough. And what I think he points to is this idea of that when you are doing work that feels like your mission, there is no better time to do that work than right now. And if, uh, and if it involves burning, let's make that flame as big as possible. Yeah. And so uh, without further ado, uh, let's just get into episode 44 with the change agent, Philip Cooper. Please enjoy. Just start with your name, title, and uh, the beginning. All right, so my name is Philip Cooper, and I am a change agent. I a couple jobs. You got to have a couple jobs to make it in Asheville, to be honest. But I work uh, at AB Tech as well uh, as a, a coordinator for a reentry program, 
And I also do group facilitation and motivational speeches through my consultancy, Change Agent Cooper LLC. Now, how did we get here? That's a good question. How did we get here? We was on Charlotte Street. And I was over there at Charlotte Street Computers checking in with one of my clients who works there. Uh, shout out to Jim Mayer for being a second chance uh, employer. So I was over there checking with uh, one of my clients that works there. And I was outside walking my puppy, Jax, American Bully. And uh, I had on an East Fork pottery shirt. Shout out to East Fork as being a, a second chance employer. Equitable hiring. Hallelujah. Um, and then you, I ran into y'all, right? Yeah. And you was like, oh, you work at East Fork. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, I, I, I can't. Anything I could say to start a conversation so that we could have then yeah. pet the dog. Yeah, we were like, all right, who is this guy? He's got Eastbrook T-shirt on. He's got like, the cutest little puppy. I'm like, in the if world. you were to, if you were to engineer an outfit like a like what could be going on to get us to say hello, it's an American bulldog, and it's like yeah. East Fork or some like, brand like that we've heard of. Up girls or something like. <laughs> Perfect. This is a perfect. That's a Tony <laughs> magnet, a hundred percent of the time. Oh, just an American man. bulldog puppy. So that he was, I think Jax was like days old or something. Yeah, when, he was when, really small. He was really small then, but he's blew up, man. He's 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 grown very quickly. Yeah. But uh, at that point in time, he was real little. Yeah, a big old puppy feet, and yeah. you're like, that's gonna be a big dog. Mm-hmm. He was actually we got him a little early. Yeah, and when y'all see me, I want to say Jax may have been. Like seven weeks, wow. six or seven weeks. Cool. Uh, and so my family had an American Bulldog, and Jax looked like a little baby version of it. So we said hello uh, on the street, and there was, I would like to say, Sparks flew, but there was like some instant energy that we got from you. We're like, I, we need to know Philip. We need to know <laughs> what's happening uh, with Philip and, and hear the story and support however we could. Yeah. We happen to have this little podcast, and this is, a, I, I hope, a platform where we can share the good work that you're doing. Man, awesome. Awesome. Totally down for, um, you know, getting a message out there. Because what, what we ran into, like, early in the game was uh, – and and it's not just me that this happens to. Like there are some people that are doing some amazing work in silos, and they're just not in the buddy system, mm. right? In Asheville, you'll see articles. Even you'll see articles talking about the achievement gap and the opportunity gap. Those gaps come because of the buddy system. There are some people that are doing some amazing work that people just don't hear about, right? So um, that's that's it's awesome that you had this platform because I'm gonna tell my story authentically unfiltered i'm gonna try not to cuss because i want to be a preacher soon and so i quit cussing so i ain't gonna cuss that much okay there's a chance that i do by accident sarah probably sorry right. i'm probably gonna get fired up and cuss <laughs> <laughs> sarah, this is a, a pg-13 yeah yeah. Podcast. yeah i might cuss i might cuss i get People fired up fire. it's just depending on what questions you ask me i might get fired up you know what i'm saying it, yeah. it just happens like that sometimes so um, what is the, I don't know if it's been said yet, what is the name of the program that you, you're running here at AB Tech? So this program is called Upskill Western North Carolina. Uh, when it was in, when it was created, um, the role that I had, it was a part-time role. It was 29 hours a week. And it was supposed to serve uh, low-level nonviolent offenders and people with food stamps, SNAP benefits. And um, so I had 29 hours a week, and um, I was to get the numbers up at uh, NC Works, which is one of the uh, the organizations that offer career services. Uh, so to get the numbers up at NC Works, as well as get people who are receiving food stamps to get certain trainings and come out of poverty, get livable wage jobs and come out of poverty. Um, in that role, that 29-hour-a-week role, uh, what I ran into was me not being able to just focus on low-level nonviolent offenders. You know, my story is I, I did prison time myself. Prison saved my life. Mm-hmm. I w- I'm not um, I, I wasn't a low level nonviolent offender like my first charge in high school was. You know, I start, mm-hmm. I caught my first charge at 16. But like um, prison saved my life. So I'm real passionate about helping those people who are returning from prison uh, and they have that gift of desperation. Like they just want a shot. They want to make it. They don't ever want to go back. So. In that role, I'm working in the courthouse, and I'm running into people, people I grew up with, people I know, and they seeing me in this role, and they're like, can you help, 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 help? So it was hard for me to just focus on low-level nonviolent, right? So um, 
And then the piece about people with uh with food assistance. You know, I grew up on food 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 stamps. Like I remember back in the day, um, <laughs> I remember back in the day they had a booklet. You would tear the food stamps out of a booklet, right? And they had government cheese and that peanut butter. Well, that pe- hey, that peanut butter was something serious. But uh, so I grew up on it. So there's no shade when I say when I make these next statements. You know, there's no shade at all. But um, for one, the charges I had, I didn't even qualify for food stamps. Mm. There are many people who are returning from incarceration that can't get food assistance because of certain felonies that they have. They are indefinitely disqualified from receiving those benefits. That is a North Carolina thing because they can change that to to say you're not indefinitely disqualified. There have been some states who made some adjustments and we did make some adjustments in North Carolina. However, um, the modifications was to permit certain lower level felonies to be able to get it. So in that role, I'm running into people that are all disqualified from receiving my services and they're asking me for help. So I had to do something about it. So at that point in time, um, I basically, uh, for lack of better words, I did what the hell I wanted to do Mm -hmm. because I'm not I'm that guy, man. I'm close. I'm in the community still. Like I go to recovery meetings. I'm in the church. I go to uh, uh, community meetings. Uh, Most of my (laughs) friends, I seen a meme on uh, social media one time and it had like, you remember the Suicide Squad movie? Mm -hmm. And it had like the Suicide Squad, (laughs) uh, uh, all of them. And it said, uh, it had a person and it said, most of my friends have master's degrees. And then it said me. Most of my friends have felonies. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I'm really close to the the justice involved citizens myself, whether it be because of the recovery community, the faith community, or just me growing up with people and, and they're getting out of prison and coming home. So um, with that being said, said I, I kind of did what the hell I wanted to do because what I ran into was I found out that, you know, and with grant funds, like that's the thing about you want to talk about grants and asking for money like like there's no guarantee you're going to have a job after a certain amount of time mm-hmm. right and so whenever i started and i was just learning about this this was this was like all new to me about grants and all this stuff so when i found out that the position was temporary i was like well i'm getting ready to make a statement on the way out mm-hmm. <laughs> and so i started advocating for people showing up at career expos showing uh people start at and started making connections shout out to april brown i remember uh she had invited me to be on a uh, equitable hiring panel at uh the wnc uh the wnc human resource association and then that invitation to that panel led to me getting even the connection with Alex at East Fort, mm-hmm. right? Shout out to Alex uh, Matisse and Daniel Vuno. I think that's how you pronounce it. That's my homeboys. Uh, second chance hiring. Uh, and they pay good wages. Amen. But um, that panel led to those connections. So it was just more speaking engagements, just meeting more people. And they're introducing me to other people. And the next thing you know, Upskill got some momentum with employers, because before, a lot of the people that was getting out of prison, they was going working at hotels and food service. Now, granted, there are people, I mean, there's, that sector needs people working, too. But for many of my people, they needed a certain amount of money mm-hmm. to survive. You want to talk about making it in Asheville, <laughs> people get out of prison, you might get your first month of housing paid for. Um, let's say you get your first month of housing paid for by an organization. That's six fifty seven hundred. A lot of people don't know halfway houses are that expensive. Mm-hmm. A halfway house costs six hundred and fifty to seven hundred dollars a month. Talk about making it in Asheville. You get out of prison, you get that first month of housing paid for, and then you going to find a job. You get paid eleven, twelve dollars an hour. How you gonna survive off that? You got probation. You got fines and fees, driver's license restoration. A lot of times you got a felony that don't allow you to get food stamps. Remember what I said earlier? Mm-hmm. So you got to get food. Then you got transportation. You might have to pay an Uber to get who who know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's just multiple things that are stacked up to the point to where it was like, okay, these people can't be going to these low paying jobs if they're going to survive. And so it turned into some advocacy that was started to be involved and, and the next thing you know, you know, the program had expanded to where we are today. And it all came from like grassroots level work. Wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, just just so that we're aware of the timeline, like w- when did you first start with this program? Uh, I first started with this program in October of 2017. Wow. So wow. And, and just to tell you a little bit about me. So I'm the kind of person I, I people like uh, practice self-care so you don't burn out. 
I'm like, man, burn this bitch down. You know what I'm saying? I said I wasn't going to cuss that much. But anyway, so I'm like, burn it down. If I'm saving lives and, and people are, are being restored as citizens and they're, and they're getting back in their families' lives and they they inviting me to kids' birthday parties at Chuck E. Cheese. They so happy. They, they're they proud. They got that self-efficacy. Their, their, their self-esteem has been impacted. You see my brother up on that on that wall right there. The people, they start feeling a purpose in a driven life. You feel me? Burn it down. Mm-hmm. And I'll let my high power take care of take care of the ashes you know what i'm saying I, it's a song we sing at church it say you turn uh uh beauty beauty from ashes mm. right so burn it down i mean you can't get ashes unless you burn it down i did not plan that but i like how that sound yeah. but it started in october of 2017 and um i came into this job because i had burnt out <laughs> since i've been out of prison i burn out in two jobs the first job i burned out in was at uh the detox center and I was working there and with limited resources, uh, state funded resources, it was like I was it was hard. I was seeing people come to the detox and then they would leave with an outpatient appointment instead of going directly to long term treatment because there were waiting lists for all these places. And it was breaking my heart like people were starting to die, you know, and it was crazy just seeing it. And uh, I burn out, you know what I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. I was working a lot of hours trying to make it in Asheville. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, then I got a job here at the community college where I started as a administrative assistant. <laughs> but I was like the only, one of the only black people that worked in the whole building. And at this by this point in time, I already had like a good relationship in the faith community and the recovery community. So I almost knew every damn body that was coming to the college, right? And so when I'm down there as an administrative assistant, Every time I tell you, it's few black people that's there and I'm in a student facing position. That award you see up there where rest in peace, uh, William, uh, Mr. Young, uh, rest in peace to him. You see the one I'm shaking hands Mm -hmm, with. mm -hmm. So um, I'm trying not to get emotional. But uh, when I when I had got because he passed away, but he was somebody that believed in me early on. But when I got that award right there, I was an administrative assistant Mm -hmm. that uh, ACE Corps award. I was an administrative assistant, bro. Um, So. What was happening was every time somebody black would come to the college and they needed some help in the enrollment lab, but they had some questions about anything, where do you think they went to? And I'm the kind of person I'll go back to telling you, you know, similar to how it is with this role when it was 29 hours a week and people saying, help, help, help. I got to figure it out. You ain't going to keep asking me help and I'm close to the resources to have, to do something about it. Mm. So the next thing you know, I started just tackling the needs of the community, um, mentoring minority males, and, and it started getting some 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 momentum but i burn out <laughs> you know mm-hmm. burn it down yeah and uh and so i left i left the college briefly and i went and worked at um uh, uh Asheville recovery center and while i was working there uh I, it was the last oh man this is dope so it was the last day you know how you put your notice in so mm-hmm. i had put my notice in at the college and they had like a going away party uh, and it was, you know, it was bittersweet, you know what I'm saying? But I was walking back to uh, my desk and I was carrying a crock pot and my phone was ringing. And, and I can I never forget, like I was carrying a crock pot. Everybody's cleaning up the uh, the break room. The party's over. It's bittersweet memories, like bittersweet <laughs> memories. And and then I set the crock pot down. I answered the phone and it was uh, somebody was like, hey, we got a perfect job for you. You know, you'd be working with, you know, I know you're passionate about working with people in criminal justice. Da, 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 da. Uh, I want you to apply for this job. And that's how I got into the 29 hour week job. Wow. Yep. Wow. Wow. So that was uh, uh, that was a high speed train of energy, which is uh, <laughs> I, I we knew that that was going to happen. There's so many things to attempt to unpack yeah. From what what you've just gone through, and we're gonna do our best to uh, to unpack with you, Sarah. I saw at least a couple times that you took notes on concepts. Is there <laughs> anything that you want to lead with? Well, yeah. So one of the questions that we always ask our guests is kind of like, well, what was that defining moment for you when you decided to go into whatever industry it is that you're in? So for you, I kind of want to go back to what was like. Was there a rock bottom for you? And can you describe that moment? And how, who yeah. helped you to turn so around? And, and That rock bottom moment was, and I always say that prison saved my life. Um, prison really saved my life because I was on drugs and I was using drugs. Uh, the saying is a monkey can't sell bananas. Mm. <laughs> you know, and, um, and so me going to prison, it saved my life. And that rock bottom was me being in the county jail here in Buncombe. 
uh, you have a wristband on to identify you. And so on that wristband, you see your mugshot. My mugshot, my, I had bug eyes. Like, it's almost comedic. I can show y'all when we shut this down, I will find it and show you. Like, And every time I ordered canteen, when you get your canteen receipt, it has your mugshot. So I would look at that. I would have to see that picture. And I, I was in the county jail for about six, seven months before I got shipped off to prison. And so just looking at that, it was so painful because I knew I, I had done too much that day whenever the crime was committed. And, um, you know, that was that was the rock bottom for me sitting in that county jail, not knowing how much knowing I was going to get some time, not knowing how much mm-hmm. um, I can remember. My dad uh, had brought my my middle child, Naomi. That's Naomi in that picture right there uh, with the red hoodie, the one that's to my to the right mm-hmm, of me. Mm-hmm. So that's Naomi. She was um, about two years old. And um, the visits in the county jail back then, it was like a, a, a glass between you and the person. And I can remember being in there and my it was killing my dad, like me getting in trouble and living that lifestyle. It was really it was killing my dad. It was killing my dad worse than it was worse than it was doing me. That's a picture of me and him when I was in prison. I like my clients to see this kind of stuff when they come see me because that makes it easier for them to open up. when They're like, oh, Lord, he's been in my shoes before. But um, he brought her to see me at a visit. And I can remember uh, he always looked down during all of this this process. But I can remember her saying, get daddy out of there or trying to trying to get to me. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I'll never forget that pain because she really literally was like trying to get get to me. And um, that's that's some of my rock bottom kind of moments. Yeah. But as far as what helped me turn around was really just just doing time with some old, uh we call OG's original gangsters. Like some of them guys in there that had a lot of time that wasn't getting out. And um and and just a, a rewind back to when I was in like fourth and fifth grade, teacher saying, uh, oh, "You're so smart. You got so much potential. Why do you act like that? Aren't you tired of going to ISS? You got you look at these grades and look at your behavior. This just doesn't add up. You got so much potential." And then here I am at prison after we finished pumping some iron. We just walking some laps. We used to walk laps after we pumped some iron. And I'm walking around with L, this dude named L. He, I don't know. He, I don't think he's getting out. He's just saying, yeah, little bro, when you get out, bro, I want you to do good, man. You got too much potential. <laughs> you know, here you go saying the same thing that my elementary teacher said, my elementary school teacher said, right? So it was being in there with the real gangsters. Like the people that I typically would look up to, like, yeah, you know, he did X, Y, and Z. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's the idol. And me getting in there and they saying, bro, you got a chance when you get out, man. Screw this ain't where it's at, man. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So that that was a major part. And that's why I'm so passionate about what's called peer support and peer mentoring. Um, because, you know, it's so magical when somebody who has actually been in your shoes gives you some advice and some feedback and some, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's a lot different when it comes from them. And, and that's really what played a, a, a big role in the change. You know what I'm saying? When, when I got out. Dang. And that, that's kind of, it, it, you, I think alluded to recovery programs. Is that kind of like a 12 step type of a program where peer support is, seems to be one of the foundational parts of that yeah. process? So, yeah, so you got, I mean, you got the 12 step meetings and that's more of a, um, that was the found, that's what really laid the foundation for me. And I still go to, uh, 12 step meetings. As a matter of fact, my anniversary was yesterday, January the 16th and I'm celebrating y'all. If y'all want to come, you can come. It's open to the public. uh, I'm not sure how packed it'll be, but next, uh, next Tuesday at, uh, seven 30, I'll be celebrating, um, but I ain't gonna How put. I years? can't put all uh, eleven. Wow, eleven years. I, I don't know if I could put all the information out on the air because it's an, an this, anonymous. This, yeah, this won't. But be after this is over, I'll tell you the whole cool. uh, thing. But um, but yeah. So twelve steps is definitely the foundation for me as far as recovery. And inside of twelve steps, we believe the therapeutic value of one addict helping another is without parallel. Mm. So it's you know it's peer support. It's people who've been in your shoes, giving you suggestions. How did, how, this is how I got through a breakup. This is how I got through the IRS stripping my bank for drug taxes. This is how I got through baby mama drama. This is how I got through home ownership, you know, or having a puppy, (laughs) you know what I'm saying? This is how I got through. So, yeah. And I've also heard, um, that there's some degree of research that supports it as well, but the act of support, Supporting other people is one of the strongest ways to support yourself. Mm-hmm. Does that feel true? Exactly. As well? One of the cliches we have is the only way to keep what you have is by giving it away. Mm. And that's why I may sound articulate when talking about the criminal justice system or what it takes 
for effective reentry services um, because that's all I talk all the time. That's what I pre. I, it's like a preacher mm-hmm. now preaching that message, you know, to people that's returning, you know, and and with it being uh, a fresh on my mouth, it's it, fresh on my lips. It's always preserved. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yep, that's a yeah. proverb. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what I mean, what does it take in your opinion for someone to you know reenter the world after being incarcerated? Well, in a perfect world, and if any people that are wealthy and want to participate in some real philanthropy, listen up. Mm -hmm. So what it would take is we would need, um, I say, about three to five change agents in place to engage, work closely with the prison system and and establish that rapport within like 90 days of that person being released. Start corresponding with them then, assessing their needs then. And when they get on, when they get home, welcome them home. Now, that's just from the service provider perspective. Right. So when they get home, they got somebody that's holding their hand to get the resources on the way to the job interview. I'm giving you a motivational speech on the way to this place that's going to give you career services. You know, I'm telling you about, you know, we can tell some war stories, some prison war stories, you Mm -hmm. know, just just getting a relationship there. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that's from a service provider perspective, we definitely need somebody that can just accompany them through that process for maybe like the like that, that really uh, uh, intense engagement for at least the first couple of weeks and then still a consistent follow up for at least 90 days. Right. Because if a person and now that was from a service provider perspective, now that service provider perspective is also leaning on what the individual does. So that individual saying, you know, uh, being honest, like if they had a drug problem before being honest about that drug problem and not trying to play it off. okay, bro, you got a drug problem. Well, here's what here's some things that I expect you to do in order to not return to that lifestyle. This is what I did. Mm -hmm. This is what many people I know did in order to not return to that lifestyle. So from their perspective, they got to participate in the process. They got to go to their support groups. You know what I'm saying? You don't like groups Well, you're going to have to check in with me often, you know, but for the most part, when people get out, when they have that back to what I said, that gift of desperation, they are humble and humility is one of the primary principles in the first step. So if they're humble, they're going to be willing really to do whatever you, you know what I'm saying? Like, show me how to get to where you at, bro. Show me how to have peace and be back in my kid's life and own a home and, and not be looking over my shoulder when the police behind me. Well, I still kind of do that. That's a habit, but you know what I'm saying? Like those kind of things. And so the expectation for them is to participate in the plan, make their meetings, be honest and upfront with me, you know, checking in with me. Like, like if they working at a certain place and the work culture ain't up to speed with diversity, hint, hint, then maybe you need to have a, a really consistent check in with me talking about how your day went. So I can give you some advice on how to survive that until we find you another job, you know, just little things like that. Wow. So then what all does the program provide? Because if that's aspirational, are we yeah. close to that with uh, Upskill WNC? I mean, I've been one man, bro. Wow. You know, doing this work uh, all the way up till we got uh, another part-time person. Shout out to AB Tech. You know, they, they, they came up with a way to get me some part-time help. You know, and Dr. Shelley White, she was amazing. She went to be the president of Haywood Community College. But, like, man, that lady is really amazing. She was a really good leader. Um, I'll just give you this real quick. So it was a – I don't know if I can, how much I can give. But either way it goes, something had occurred to where I was on the, uh, on the hot seat. And I was thinking that I was about to get fired, to be honest, because there was just something that had occurred. It wasn't nothing that I did wrong. There was just some friction between me and someone. I'm passionate about what I do. They're passionate about what they do. And and so there was some friction. And so I'm in her office. I'm thinking I'm about to get fired. And we start talking about kind of like a conversation like this. And then she's looking at my reports. The next thing you know, she goes up to the whiteboard and starts talking about sustainability of the work that I was doing and said, okay, I want you to report directly to me from now on. Wow. Right. But, um, as far as uh, if we're there yet to what I'm saying, like the snap of Thanos's fingers and have what I want. Um, hell no. Uh, no, because <laughs> it takes money. Yeah. Like it, it, it's really going to take the right person meeting me and seeing what has been done and them saying, you know what? We want to support that. Like Van Jones, if you listening, bro, if you listening, let's have lunch one time. 
Let's have lunch one time. You want testimonials? I got you. You want face to face testimonials? I got you. You want to pull up at halfway houses? I got you. Right. Because when the right people with the resources hear about this, they're going to support it. Mm -hmm. It's just not that easy to get in those places because I'm going to go back when we talk about the opportunity gaps. Right. If you're not in that that buddy buddy system, you're not always going to be favored. And that's just not a Buncombe County thing. That's really a Carolina, th- a North Carolina thing. I'm not going to say it's as much national. Uh, I'm not going to say it's a national thing because I know of some amazing national, nationally uh, renowned programs that are funding. As soon as they hear about what's going on, like Vera, they funding. MacArthur Foundation, they funding. When they hear about what's going on and it makes sense and it's doing numbers, they're like, oh, you know, so nationally we have a lot of uh, nonprofits and organizations that are doing great work whenever they meet people like me. Hmm. So whoever's listening, you know, if this is some work that you want to support, you want to see something happen. Listen, I, I mean, I'm not here to brag. I'm, I'm trying to work on not being too cocky. Some somebody said that uh, I was arrogant and I think there could there could be some truth to that. So I am trying to work on not being too cocky. But I will tell you this, that right there, that award you see right there talking about reentry right there that came from, that what that that came that came from a one man. Real talk, you know, um, a gap filler. It what and it's not really that I'm super special. It's just that, like I say, like if you close enough to the resources and you close to the community, I command you to be the bridge. Mm. <laughs> I command you to be the bridge. And with me, you know, I, I I had no choice. I wouldn't have peace in the community if I didn't start bridging the gap. Being that close to the community and that close to the resources, you gotta be the bridge if you want peace. You know, you want to talk about a turning point, man. I got two friends that are that are dead right now. You feel me? Because at this point in time, I wasn't, I, the bridge wasn't solid yet. So I remember uh, one of them, you know, I was corresponding with him when he was in prison. Now, this was way back in like, I took, this was in 2017. His sister was, was corresponding with me because our kids went to the same, uh, went to the YWCA together in uh, daycare. And she was telling me like, yeah, bro, about to come home. I'm going to call you on three way. You know what I'm saying? Just checking in like so you can be ready for him. But I didn't have all the resources in place the way I do now. I didn't have all them employers yet. I didn't have the April Brown bringing me the panels to speak. I didn't have the Alex introducing me to other people and, and the career expos. I didn't have all of that in place yet. I was just advocacy trying to get you connected as fast as I can. But when he came home, it took a while because he was a habitual offender. And so it wasn't easy to find him a job. And so he ended up finding a job, getting paid a little bit, because some of them staffing agencies be trying to pimp people. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And ain't I don't I'm not against the staffing agency model because I just started one that I just launched. I'm just I haven't been able to do contracts yet because I, I gotta get some more funds to be able to compensate my people. But he went to a staffing agency that was giving them like ten dollars an hour. You know what I'm saying? He got three kids, ten dollars an hour. And so, you know, he ended up going back to that old lifestyle. Because you got kids that need, and he, so he went back to the old lifestyle, and he's no longer with us today. And it was gunned down. Um, then another one of my good friends just died not too long ago. He got out, I want to say in like November of 2018, you know, and when he got out, you know, I'm sitting there trying to trying to get him connected. And, and it's some things I'm not sure if I can say on the podcast, you know, but it, it was, it was, it, it got, it was very challenging, but it was systemic issues, it was systemic issues that that led to him going back to that old lifestyle because because a lot of people, when they get out, they got that gift of desperation. That's why I'm so much about second chances and having that 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 relationship started on the inside. Welcome you home and let's let's get to work, because like when people got that gift of desperation, they ready to do whatever it takes. And so um, he had that gift of desperation, but the, the things just weren't in place to to meet the needs that he had. And he went back to that old lifestyle. But what do you expect from a person like one of the people that I really admire? He's one of the pioneers with all of this criminal justice reform in North Carolina, a brother named Dennis Gaddy. He says, if you make it hard for them to do good, you make it easy for them to do bad. Hmm. And that's what we're up to up against when we talk about returning citizen affairs. We want to make it as easy as possible for you to do good when you get out of prison. So if you don't do the right thing, you deserve to go back. Like, and I don't mind saying that. Like, I'm not a person that's for diversion and getting rid of prisons and all that stuff. Hell, they needed to lock my black ass up. You hear me? I was dangerous. I was high and dangerous. I needed to be locked away. Right? So if we have prison providing the appropriate programs, 
you know, because really prison programming is something else that needs some reform. But even if the programs ain't up to up to speed, you got programs on the outside that's doing what I'm talking about with that in reach and stuff. I mean, that's saving a lot of lives. So that's kind of what we would need in place. And I think that we can make it easier for them to do good. I love that. Oh, I, yes, there's uh something that I always, in, in my own life, I try to make doing the right thing as easy as possible. There's like, you know, uh, habit hacking, which is mm-hmm. if you want to start running, put your running shoes by the door. Like you can't walk past them. They ha- it, Now it's the thing that you do. And I don't want to trivialize what you're talking about, which is a whole other scale of operation, but there is a lot of truth in making the, making mm-hmm. the right thing easy. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I heard from that is that support looks like money and it probably looks like employers that are, that are, uh, one of the things we talked about before the conversation was, uh, just economic certified. So they're paying mm-hmm. living wages mm-hmm. and they're open to being a second opportunity employer. Mm-hmm. Um, what all do you look at when you look at, uh, partners in the community yeah. as businesses? So to be honest, one of the things that's a blessing now, and it wasn't like that when I got out of prison, it was not like that. It's like the unemployment rate. You know what I'm saying? We have like the lowest unemployment rate in the state. So these businesses are starting to be more uh, open to hiring folks. But even even before then, like they have these this this hiring policies, this criteria that they use to determine how to vet the the people who have backgrounds. So um, as far as the relationships with the employers, let me help you vet because every HR professional ain't familiar with the criminal justice system. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's certain uh, 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 legal jargon that is confusing to a person that's not an attorney, period. So you see a charge, you might have some biases. You might even see a name that sounds a little too black and you might be biased to hire them. And they got so you already got a, a bit of uh, uh, microaggressions and you got a bit of uh, what is it? Um. Uh, golly, some type of bias that my boy be taught. Uh, Robert Thomas always be t- implicit. You already got the implicit bias, and you're in a position to hire and change somebody's life. But you have implicit bias, and you have some prejudice about yourself. And and now you're looking at this name that looks like a a black name. It sounds like a black name, and they have a and they have an armed robbery. It meets your criteria about the time that has passed. It's case by case, but I say no. How did you vet? Mm. Like, I mean, <laughs> like who raised who? I mean, like, mm. and if you're not familiar with that, a lot of people keep getting told no. So when I came in the fold, it was a lot of educating employers, too. And the additional mentoring, like the ones that I'm working with now, they're appreciative of the fact that we have a team like, you know, that that we're working closely with the individual that we're referring. We're not just referring them and then, you know, good luck. We're referring them. We're checking it, everything good. Is it anything we can do with further support? Do they need boots or anything? You know, just mm-hmm. just supporting. But like we want living wage jobs, you know, um, in Asheville, just economics is the ones that certify uh, um, the people that's live, the companies that's living wages. I just got on their board. Shout out to Just Economics, Vicky Meath and them. But um, as far as what the what we're gonna provide, the level of services that we're providing, they need to be paying them a living wage. You know, we're we're doing something that the staff you paying the staffing agencies, you ain't paying us to. <laughs> we doing this for free, so we definitely need our people to be getting paid paid uh, uh, living wages. But um, as far as who we choose to partner with in the community, of course, we have the the traditional reentry service providers that was in place before us. And we just all come to the table and work together. How do we better support each other? You know, so if they were doing reentry services before they're at the table with us now, we're all collaborating and sharing information and sharing resources. Like I might get somebody, a, a company might reach out to me and say, we need to hire three entry level entry level machine operators and they don't need to have any type of experience they just need to have transportation then i might send out a blast email to about five organizations and say hey they looking for this who you got let's let's get them out there Mm -hmm. but um as far as community agencies i didn't want to throw employers out there uh, mostly because uh some places aren't they don't want to advertise that they're doing the second chance hiring. And I, and I understand and respect that because of politics and bureaucracy and stuff. So some places aren't like trying to be out there like, yeah, we hire people with backgrounds. Mm-hmm. So I get that. 
But as far as the community agencies that we're working with, uh, community action opportunities, they have what's called LifeWorks Life Coaches. So we work closely with them, and they do a lot of great work. They have additional funds to help uh, the clients out. We um, do uh, work with Goodwill. They have the Career Center, and they also have what's called Project Reentry. So they offer classes inside several prisons. I went through Project Reentry when I was in prison. Uh, we work closely with the uh, Buncombe County Reentry Council, in which Governor Cooper uh, launched like several councils all over the state. And uh, we work closely with Spark Foundation. In Spark Foundation, that's uh, as far as interviewing nonprofits, uh, it would probably be great if you could interview uh, Spark. Um, they're doing a lot of good work and they and they really specialize in working with those violent offenders like myself. Like, you know, what I'm saying so um, they they really have some great things going on over there. They have some classes like uh, that they teach and then they also hire what's called peer support specialists to work with the individuals. Right. So. um you know, and it's other it's some other nonprofits out there like Working Wheels. You know, mm-hmm. we work close with love Working Wheels. Um, the the way that they got that set up is really helping people. You know, transportation is a huge barrier in Asheville, and Working Wheels has actually come with a solution. Some people keep meeting about meeting about meeting, but then there are some people that mess around and come up with a solution, and that's what Working Wheels is doing towards uh, transportation. Um, working closely with Just Economics, of course, because they're letting us know who's living weight certified. Mm-hmm. So that's how I pick and choose who, uh, what companies I, you know, will refer to. And um, what other nonprofits are we working close with? Right now, that's the main ones. If I left anything out, is charge it to my to my head, not my heart. Oh, I yeah. love that <laughs> saying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering if there are any other resources that i.e. like books or um i don't know something on the internet websites whatever that you found particularly helpful or that you recommend to people that you're helping to be honest um from the substance use disorder standpoint because 70 percent of people 70 percent of people who are in prison have substance use disorder a lot of those the support groups and stuff like that they'll tend to have their own literature within those fellowships And that process goes the way it goes with their own literature. But as far as like referring people to read certain books, I have recommended uh, a book from T.D. Jakes to someone. I let someone borrow that book. It was called Soar. But um, most of my connections and stuff that I've gotten came from LinkedIn, Mm -hmm. believe it or not. Like I never knew what LinkedIn was about. I would I would even make jokes about LinkedIn. And then when I got more into this like HR role, I was like, you know, and I and I was noticing how people I had somebody ask me, like, you know, are you on LinkedIn? Let's connect. And then so I start going on there, I start following stuff and I seen how powerful it was. But it wasn't until like within the past year when um I had went on LinkedIn because it was a lady that had told me her son, I think her Carrie Wagner had said that her son uh and Carrie Wagner, Mana Food Bank, that's another partner. I'm sorry, y'all. I love y'all at Mana. Uh Mana Food Bank has uh, they had a speaker come to the Western North Carolina Human Resource Association, uh, Carrie, and she was sharing about at her son's graduation, I think at like maybe work, uh, Georgetown. Is that in D.C., Georgetown? Yep. yep. Uh, uh, um, that the guy, Brian Ferguson, who was the director of Returning Citizen Affairs at the time, she was talking about how he spoke, and she came up to me when I, the whole meeting was over. She was like, Philip, you should check him out. You know, just and she was just saying, check him out, read up on him. So I went to LinkedIn. Like, I'm not reading. I ain't checking up on I just went to LinkedIn. I looked him up, hit connect. And then I seen that he had viewed my profile a couple times. You know, because LinkedIn will let you know people viewed your, viewed your profile. I was like, hmm, okay, I see you, God. And so I um, I reached out to him, and he followed up. And he sent me, like, how to establish certain things and what their process is like. And, and, um, and then, you know, and then found out they have another one. And I started going on LinkedIn, and I would just type, like certain hashtags like reentry and I would see these other programs and come to find out that they have a returning citizen affairs office of returning citizens and affairs in Boston. And I'm all talking about LinkedIn. I'm talking about LinkedIn. Yeah. So I reached out to him and me and him ended up having an hour and a half long conversation, him explaining the process, the prison and reach process and like what type of nonprofits you choose to work with is what's going to be your ticket. Like he was breaking it all the way down. We was on the phone for an hour and a half and he still messages me to say, where you at with things, you know, what I'm saying? Yeah. all the way in Boston. And this all came from LinkedIn. That's what is in reach. When I'm saying get with them within 90 days of release, all of that stuff came from them. 
they was telling me the best practice that they have and they doing good work. We're talking DC and Boston, you know, they got to, they can't afford not to, (laughs) you know? Wow. So there, I mean, I I don't, it's, I feel that it could be easy to over, to overlook, but there seems like, uh, you've, you talked about it earlier, but the idea that you, when you see something, you seem to go at it with a tenacity and enthusiasm that uh, s- something's gonna happen. Like so- it, something's gonna happen because I like I, I I'm willing it to. Um, and I'm wondering, is that what you said that your teachers were talking about as a as a young uh, student? Is that relatively new? Is that being empowered by past? wins because of that enthusiasm like how do you how do you keep showing up in this way to be that bridge that you talked about earlier i think it i think it got well i'm very religious Mm -hmm. so let me let me say that like i'm i'm spiritual and religious like some people will be like yeah i'm spiritual but i'm not religious i'm both Mm -hmm. and i'm trying to redefine how people look at christianity as a religion right because i'm christian i'm proud to be christian i'm proud of my savior dying for me um, and I remember who I prayed to when I was in jail, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and having peace from those prayers. So I like to say pray and slay. Right. So as far as how do I keep that tenacity? I do a lot of praying. I listen to a lot of uh, Christian hip hop. Lecrae is an artist I like. It's an artist named Bizzle, uh, an artist named Seven. I'll be listening to them. It's a new one that just moved to Astro named Mooney Music. Actually, that's who cut my hair today. His name is uh, Mooney. Uh, Mooney music. So I'd be listening to the to the music does a lot of power for me. See, I got music tatted on my hand. Yeah. You know, it, 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 and, and that's another thing that's always been in my life. And that's why people got to be careful with, with letting their kids listen to certain rap music. Because I remember when when you want to talk about Jeezy, talking about thug motivation, Jeezy really motivated my thugginess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he really liked certain songs, really motivated it. So when I was in prison, I remember walking and listening to my music. And so the same way now. But as far as like you, you asked if it was past victories that led to who jesus to the perseverance mm-hmm. right the the perseverance comes because it has to be done like i said like my fr- these are people i grew up with that's getting out of prison they aunts and they mamas they might go to my church or they know my daddy and they like hey i need you to talk to so-and-so or somebody i went to school with they say yeah my baby father about to get out i can tell he changed he really needs some help like i got to make something happen like, like I said, like I'm close enough to the community and I'm close enough to the resources, then I have to be the bridge or I won't have peace or I can change my job. Mm. Right. I can change my job. I can I can go and go to Industrial Maintenance Academy and maybe I be, I, I go the route of becoming a CNC machinist or something. Mm-hmm. Right. Maybe I need to change my job. But as long as I'm close enough to the resources and I'm close enough to the people, I will continue to do it and and send the success stories like the success stories. Like we just had one. And and that's uh, what we're going to we're hoping to do a film on this. This is a, a freebie for the listeners. But um, had one. She just got custody of her kids back, bro. You feel me? Like she came from being uh, uh, in prison. She went through one program, compl- successfully completed that program, got underpaid at up an employer that was underpaying her because of her background. I have reason to believe. Uh, but she was there and, and then she reached out for help for uh I don't know what she somebody told her to call me and just check in. This one guy, he was a former client. And he was like, hey, you need to meet blah, blah, blah. And so she called and then I heard about her story. We fundraised to get her driver's license restored because that's another thing that we're working on too. Like driver's license restoration, fines and fees and stuff. It's crazy. That's a whole podcast by itself. If you want, just let me know if you want me to get some of the people that's uh, working on that together. But for now we had these philanthropic efforts to the program from people like the Walnut Cove community, Colton and groom WNC bridge foundation that was giving us money for supportive services funds. So we had money in place to help people. Man, we paid 400 and something dollars to get her, her, her driver's license restored. Maybe a little more than that. She had a seatbelt ticket from Mac Dow County. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That they weren't willing to waive. So we, we, we fundraised, got it paid. So got our license back. Got her a job. Shout out to East Fort Pottery. You feel me? Paying her good. She loves her job. Good work culture. And then uh, uh, the next thing you know, we do a, a, a working wheels referral. You know, so now she got a car. It's crazy. I can't wait to do the film. But, uh, you know, yeah. But that's that's what keeps me going. We get them success stories. Like I have a, a crazy a crazy week. All week can be pressure, which it always is, until I get some more help. It's crazy. And then just getting them success stories. You yeah. know, it's like it's paying off. And to, just to go back to the bridge thing, in, in your it seems like to go and become a CNC machinist, right? 
I think that you would have your, based on what <laughs> our experience so far, I feel like you would have your own form of uh, restlessness and lack of peace yeah. if you were to leave this good work behind now. Yeah. I feel like you're probably too far in. You, you, yeah. Could you walk away from this? You've talked yeah. about burnout in the in the past. Are you close to burnout? Because it does seem like there's a lot of responsibilities, yeah. a lot of uh, relationships, and, and the, like... To be a giver mm-hmm. energetically and with actual connections that you you are, mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I a I hope that you're replenishing. And it seems like we talked about yeah. your, your workout yeah. this morning. Yeah. You got your religion. Yeah. Um. But are you? Or do you have any fear of burnout? I know you joked like, "Let's burn it down. Forget about burning out." I'm trying to. I'm trying to just blaze. But is there? Is there any fear that like you're I don't too know, committed? Man. I, I... Right now, I, I think I'm in my I think I'm in my grace right now. I love it. I really like where I'm at now. Now there are some steps, some more steps higher to go as far as decision making abilities, like maybe getting into something with local government, and that is something that I do want to do. Like in the future, I do want to be the first county commissioner with a felony. You know what I'm saying? I don't think there has ever been one. If there is, then shout out to you, bro <laughs> or sis. But um, I, I would love to be a county commissioner. Um, you know, you'll notice I got the black Godfather hanging up on my wall. You know, it was a good show on Netflix and it, and it gave me some inspiration because this was a lesser educated guy that was just good with networking and connecting the dots. And it reminded me of me. And right now I'm starting to get connected with some people who are really like trying to hear what's missing in the community. And with that being said, now the resources are being in places. And now my my connect connectability skill is going at another level and I'm seeing greater impact. So I think I'm getting close to being at a different position with more decision making abilities. And that's what the answer is going to be. And I'm trusting God that um, that I'm not going to burn out now. Because mm-hmm. at this point in time, as you said, I am in too deep. Now, I can fall back, and I am seeing some good things like, oh, Jesus, we got this grant like from Appalachia Regional Commission. So I do got help. Like I told you, AB Tech gracefully hit me. They they did help me with a part-time position. So I got one part-time person working with me right now with the community-based work. But um, a speaking engagement I had. So my man, Dwayne Barton, shout out to Dwayne Barton. I don't know if y'all heard of Hood Huggers. That might be another person y'all need to meet too, Dwayne Barton, talking about making it in Asheville, learning more about Asheville. It's, it, he, he's solid. But he had connected me with somebody. They was doing this listening session in Wilkesboro. And so he he knew some of them, and and so he threw my name in there as a recovery. You know, he knew I was in long term recovery and had been, and so he threw my name in there. So they hit me up. And it was like, you see that right there, that Appalachia Strong. That was from when I spoke on a panel with them. But um, they're really uh, establishing a recovery ecosystem with Appalachia Regional Commission because of the opioids and the substance use epidemic. They're trying to come up with solutions. And it's not just on mental health and substance use providers, but workforce development also has a role to play in it, too. And so um, they invited me to this listening session. And while I was down, when I was actually before I got down, I was on the phone and he just heard a little bit about my story. He's like, hey, man, would you be willing to participate in the?" <laughs> and I was like, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess. And so that's when I found out how how big they are and how powerful they are as far as resources and and decision making. So I get down out of Wilkesboro and I'm sharing at the listening session. And the next thing you know, I I get some more contacts. Somebody walked up to me and was like, Hey, uh, uh, and and like, just think about the movie, the black Godfather, like how he was making connections all the way up to where he was tight with Quincy Jones and meeting Barack Obama. Like this guy, like you got to see it, the black Godfather. Um, but like, so I'm there and, um, someone walked up to me and was like, Hey man, give me a, uh, give me a call. I'd love to hear more about the work you're doing. And that ended up leading to, uh, applying for a grant with them. I knew nothing about asking for money. I was just having a conversation about recovery and, and then the work I was doing. And, um, and now it ends up being like, uh, governor Cooper recommended funding us for another two years. So that means I do have a job for two more years. Right. But and it all came from a listening session, you know, so that's why community is important because the people in the community knows what's happening. So, like, if we really want to have an impact on the community, we got to make sure people from that community, not just people just because you're a certain color don't mean that you represent that community. No, no. All right. No, there's no truth to that. But people that's actually from the communities that's in those communities that can identify who their champions are. And have those people at the table whenever we make decisions about helping those communities. That's how we really, really have a change in those places. Damn. Yeah. (laughs) 
So I'm wondering too if there's something, if there's certain projects or goals that you have kind of coming up in your mind for the future. So my staff in HC, you know, I was uh, blessed um, and awarded a, a grant to start my own staff in HC. Shout out to the Tipping Point grant, and I partner with uh, Just Economics. Um, and so the it's it's called Higher Power Staffing. So there's some more steps to take. We got this lovely Mountain Community Capital Fund in uh, in Buncombe County that we have, and they're trying to do, um, you know, it's a new loan guarantee fund for small business entrepreneurs in Asheville and Buncombe County, and we must have local businesses that reflect our diverse community. So here I come, you know. So I'm gonna try to get some of that bread because with the, what I'm what I learned was with a staff agency, you have to have you got to have some capital up front to be able to pay your people weekly when they go to work before you get the money for the contract. And so that's where I'm at now is working on getting that done. Mm -hmm. Will it conflict with my job now? No, it will not. My job now we're changing. Like I said, with moving forward with my current role. It's focusing on. It's going to be solely focusing on people who have been released from prison within the past year that have served over a certain amount of time. With the staffing agency, I'm focusing on underrepresented populations, justice involved people, people that are interested in getting a new skill, and they, you know, they're going to work at the staffing agency in certain hours outside of the classroom hours. You know what I'm saying? That's what we're going to be focusing on with that. But understanding how important it is to have diversity and service providers in the staffing agency, because you know, there's a lot of young black males specifically like in this area that, you know, they just haven't made a career move decision and there are so many opportunities they don't know about. Like I've recruited a dishwasher that's about to start working at East Fork. He's not just as involved, but it's somebody that I know, just a young black male, 22 years old, that's been washing dishes. And, you know, here I go like, hey, man, maybe you should try this out. Because if you can prep, cook and wash dishes, then you can do assembly at a manufacturer. It's a transferable skill. For sure. um, uh, GE Aviation has a video that they show and they have like a success story about a guy who was like a prep cook. And with the details that are involved with prep cooking, it was a transferable skill to what they do with uh, machining and entry level machining and stuff. So love that. Uh, one of the questions that came in from our, uh, we'll say our community was, is there any work that you do, have done, will do uh, around empowering entrepreneurship uh, in your the community that you're serving? I usually lean on the the, the experts, uh, Aisha Adams. Y'all know Aisha Adams? Oh, man, you got, oh, my God. You got that, oh, bruh. <laughs> Bro, Aisha is a beast. Equity over everything. Uh, she she's like entrepreneur superstar. Uh, uh, Emily Breed Love. Mm -hmm. uh, even our small business center here, AB Tech, Jill Sparks, Dwayne Adams. You know, um, that, that you know, I'll send people to them. Okay. You know, whenever they're entrepreneurs or Mount Biz works. You know, because that's not my area of expertise. I didn't even know I was an entrepreneur. Jill Sparks was the one that had a conversation with me one day. She was like, Philip, she said, you're an entrepreneur right now, but it's going to come out of you whether you know a lot. Cause I've always ran away from the word entrepreneur. Cause I was like, okay, entrepreneur, take a risk. No money. I got child support to pay. Hello. I mean, I can't be taking no risk. You know, I got to have Chick-fil-A when I want with all the sauces. <laughs> Hello. You know what I'm saying? So whenever, uh, whenever people was talking about entrepreneur, I'm thinking like, I can't stop working. Like I can't, I don't have time. Yeah. But what I learned my process was entrepreneur because this work that I'm doing now is what led me to my entrepreneur uh, uh, skill that I'm going towards now with the connecting people to jobs and, and this third party recruiting, this unique way of third party recruiting. When I show up in my Air Jordans talking your slang with you, telling you about job opportunities as opposed to me having a career fair and hoping that you'll come and talk to me. No, I'm all in your hood, bro. Oh, you need a job. You've been working out there. How much they paying you? Oh, they paying you 10 50 Oh, man, I can get you four more dollars an hour with the net man i just need you to commit to meeting with me at least once a week though don't try to play me though bro you see i'm trying to do big things in the community don't play me i need you to be straight up with me I'm like yeah bro i got you and that's what leads to it happening but this style of third party recruiting is the my entrepreneur ability mm -hmm. and and that's and that's how i got there but i ran from that word entrepreneur my man gene edison he another one you might want to have on he's solid he's super entrepreneur he got like Four businesses, five businesses. He got Babs, Build a Better Salad. He got J. Lee Chicken. He got Entrepreneur, Entrepreneur Podcast to start. He got so many things going on. But uh, a lot of people that's entrepreneurs, I just, I'm just now getting to where I feel comfortable saying I'm one, though. Yeah. 
I, I think that's powerful. I think you, you hit on something powerful there that you don't have to necessarily be a quote unquote entrepreneur to have an entrepreneurial spirit. Like Ooh. I think you have an entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. I think he, Tony has an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and so there's, there's definitely skills I think that yeah. you can have and then mm-hmm. apply them later on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And one of the parallels that I'm drawing to past conversations, um, cause not everyone that we've talked to has, owned their own business or Mm -hmm. is full time in the project that they're working on. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it comes back to this idea of like ownership of the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned how at the very beginning of having this 29 hour a week Mm -hmm. part time thing here, Mm -hmm. you treated it like it was the way I heard it was that you treated it like it was more than that. Mm -hmm. You took responsibility you said i'm gonna do what i'm gonna do knowing that this thing might not exist any longer so like let's do what it what needs to be done Mm -hmm. and i think it's that level of ownership of someone else's project of someone else's uh business of someone else's that's a is going to raise you up through the ranks you become the manager you become the what what, coordinator you become something bigger than what you were Mm -hmm. my grandpa always had excuse me my grandfather has a as a saying that he, he would still say today situationally, but like when I was a kid, I remember him saying all the time, if you're going to be a shit shoveler, be the best shit shoveler you can be yeah, I like because it. you won't shovel shit for long. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, well, I hope because he, he worked on chickens. He like, that was his job. He was, he would go into <laughs> chicken crates and like shovel shit out of the chicken crate. I'm getting saying shit so much, but like it's, it's a, good. it's an interesting concept and i think that you have lived th- into it and embodied it in a way that there's no doubt that this continues to grow mm-hmm. um and and serves more and more people because your your work is um i don't know it's more than anyone could ask you to actually do is what i'm seeing and i don't know yeah. if that's true but that's what i'm that's what i'm seeing i love it like people be like man i don't know how you do it but i'm living my dream mm-hmm. and As far as taking care of myself, I really am. Like, I talk fast, and I'm always on the go, you know. But, like, my family get a lot of time with me. Like, me and my wife, we're going to see – well, we're going to see Bad Boys. I wanted to see Just Mercy, but we're going to see Bad Boys tonight. You feel me? Mm -hmm. I'm with my people. I go to my recovery meetings. I'm active in the faith community, you know. um, So I'm taking care of my spirit. I pray before I slay. You know what I'm saying? Slay, but first pray. Mm. You know, so I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do. But MLK wasn't worried about burnout. Malcolm X wasn't worried about burnout. Nelson Mandela wasn't worried about burnout. John F. Kennedy wasn't worried about burnout. I seen the movie Vice and loved it. Vin, oh, Dick Cheney, he was a pretty cool dude in my eyes, but he wasn't worried about burnout. The people who were doing big things and getting to places, yeah. getting stuff done, like my man uh, Clarence Savant, like people like that, like we we can't be worried about burn, burnout. I was at church, Sound Church Ministries. Shout out to Sound Church Ministries. I was there at a service they had a couple Fridays ago, and one of the things First Lady Carmichael said was, "Stop being consumed with working and just work." Mm. And that's what I've been trying to focus on doing, you know, uh, because in the beginning, I was volunteering my time doing this, bro. Shout out to April Forrest. She was working at the hospital. I would see her at the community events. She was like a talent acquisitionist. So I would see her at the community events and we would always have a conversation at these career expos. I was talking about we I would always converse with her. And I can remember like I and it wasn't in my role. Like I was an administrative assistant. I wasn't in workforce. But I was doing this because I was starting to be close enough to the resources. So I was starting to be a bridge. But I was volunteering my time doing this stuff. So now that I'm getting paid to do it, I don't even feel like work. Like my wife had to make me leave sometimes Mm -hmm. because I got to do my because it's crazy. I'm doing director level work now, but I also got to coordinate and navigate. Right. Because it's really a couple positions that needs to be in this kind of work. There needs to be like a director doing the politicking and the connecting in the community and stuff. Then you need to have a coordinator that's or, or director of operations. And then you got to have like your change agencies out meeting with the people. Right. I'm having to do a little bit of all of that mm-hmm. right now. And I know it's temporary and I know God is going coming through to do something else. But it don't feel like work to me. You know, it don't. Yeah. It's a way of life. <laughs> to be honest, it's really a way of life. You, you, yeah. You're reminding me. There's a. I've only met this person one time in my entire life. It was I want to say, t- 2008. I want to say his name's Liam Cummings. He's Canadian. Mm-hmm. We went to this leadership college. Leadership. Excuse me. I got a cough. 
uh, Liam Cummings met this college leadership event at the University of Pittsburgh, and he made a metaphor that I'd never heard before, still never heard anyone say it the same way, but the idea that um, the human human beings and the human heart, mm-hmm. right, are, are not engines, but they are our engine. A engine is like a, it's a hundred horsepower. It is a mm-hmm. uh, hundred cubic centimeters. It, it is can only ever do X amount of work. So you put a light load on it, it can go fast. You put a heavy load on it, it'll go slow. You put too much of a load on it, mm-hmm. it breaks. Yeah. A car engine has a very specific capacity. The human heart, the human's engine, is able to do anything you ask of it, mm-hmm. especially if you give it time to get used to the work. Mm. So what I'm hearing you do is like, it wasn't your job, you added it to your plate though, <laughs> right? And then, and then over time, you can continue to add and you can continue to ask more and more of yourself. And that's why like the Mandela's and the Martin Luther mm-hmm. Kings, like they weren't worried about burnout, but you know, the 40 year old version of, mm-hmm. of me can do more than 30 year old version of me mm-hmm. can do more than 20 year old as long as I'm progressively adding to the plate and mm-hmm. to the workload. Uh, our heart, our capacity for love, our capacity for um, fellowship, whatever mm-hmm. it is, can only grow if mm-hmm. we ask it to. Yeah. But it can become. You can burn out if yeah. you just dump all of that on you. Right. And haven't uh, haven't allowed it to grow. That's a uh, and wow, Liam. Shout out to Liam Cummings <laughs> from Canada. <laughs> that that reminds it. me a lot too of um of James Clear, who I always reference because I really like him, but talking about habits or build, building habits and this is, to me reminded me of that the idea that you know you get one habit down and then it just becomes like second nature and you're like mm-hmm. oh, okay i know how to do this yeah. and then you add on more weight or more you know habits that you want to form and it just all becomes easier and easier and easier yeah. as you go along and then you're like wow i can do all of those things yeah, but mm-hmm. you can't start with all of it can't yeah. start. And I didn't, man. I'm talking about I had to learn. Like, I got mentors. I have a couple of mentors. And that's one thing that I learned, too, was, like, the power of relationships. Mm-hmm. And it's the same way in recovery. Like, in recovery, we talk about having a support network, having a sponsor. It's been the same way with this advocacy work and this, and this system-level change-level work that I've been doing. Like, I got multiple mentors. I got a mentor that helped me write certain emails. I got a mentor that uh, – um, I got a mentor that tells me, like, as far as, like, uh, budgeting and st- stuff like that. And then I got a mentor about, like, if I'm going to a certain meeting, like, I'll be like, is this the right meeting? for me to say da, 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 like well to be honest this is not the, the time ain't now to say that you know put that down on paper and be ready to say it keep practicing saying it but the time ain't now to say it and i got to have mentors mm-hmm. right because if i was to jump out there and i did in the beginning and i made some allies i ain't gonna lie i was a person that would go in a meeting and i would tell it like it is and i would look crazy and then i would have like one or two people come up to me after the meeting i'm talking stakeholders and be like Hey, give me a call. Let's get lunch sometime. Or thank you for saying that, man. I, I really appreciate it. And I'm thinking to myself, like, why the hell you ain't have my back when I was in there looking crazy? Mm-hmm. But over time, I've built those relationships with people to where they see, like, I'm really committed. I'm not just lip service. And it's not that I'm bragging. It's just I'm, I'm just being real because for any listener that's out there in the beginning stages of of being a change agent and is really wanting to have an impact, like, this, it's not going to be easy. Like, you're going to ruffle some feathers. Like, Change is usually not comfortable. Everybody ain't comfortable with change. Some people have gotten comfortable and complacent, right? And so it's going to be difficult. That's why it's so important to have that support, that network, that those mentors that help you think through it. You know, go lift some heavy weight instead of light weight that day. You know, it was harder than me. I'm going to throw 315 on the bar. I'm pissed. I got to recover from the change agency, you know, and that's, and that's what it will continue to be, you know, one day at a time, right? But this this is my calling, man. This is my purpose driven life. This reentry, prison reform, that kind of stuff. That, that's my purpose, man. When I was in prison, I worked as a treatment assistant for a program called A New Direction. And that's when I first found my love for working with people because, like, I, now they didn't shut down uh, Wayne Correctional, but I was a peer counselor. Uh, and so, like, it was a person that, you know, you would clean up the classrooms, you would write a quote on the board, you would facilitate, like, the devotional meeting. But it was a unique job to have in prison. And I got paid a dollar a day. Mm. <laughs> that was wow. one of the better jobs. Oh, wow. But, um, but like, when I was there, I remember connecting with some of these young guys. They would come from Pope Youth Center, 
uh, back then. You know what I'm saying? And Polk is one of those more challenging prisons that had a whole bunch of them young guys with a lot of time. And so I would be working with them. And, and like my ability to connect with them, I ended up getting close with a guy named Henry Parks, who was a licensed, uh, he's a licensed clinical addiction specialist. And he was overseeing a uh, program in there. And me and him got tight because he noticed it. And he ended up being a mentor for me for several years. Um, he's retired now, but, you know, he's he's out in uh, Cary, North Carolina. But he ended up being a mentor for me for several years. But but that's when I first found my, my love for working with people who, who were in prison or returning home from prison was actually while I was in prison. Wow. Wow. It, it's like a David and Goliath kind of thing where like if it's if it's if it's a weakness it's a strength if it's a strength it's a weakness and I imagine that you are a uh, a glass always overflowing versus glass <laughs> half full like what uh, is that is that feel right yeah that's uh, um I'm, I'm a, since you used the word overflow let me show you something wow. He's got a, wow. So at my church, we choose a word for the year. Last year, my wife and I, we chose the word praise. This year, what does that word say? It says overflow. So that's what my prayer is. I told you I'm religious. It's like, God, fill me up until it overflow. Fill, fill, fill my life to, to all people see is, is you overflowing out of my life. When I'm having a conversation by the way that I treat people. Right. Because it's an action. Faith is action. Right. The way that I represent the kingdom. Fill me up to where people ain't got no choice but to know. I ain't even got to say I'm Christian, but they're going to say it's it's something about you. Right. That's what I want God to do in my life until I'm dead. Because I remember how there were some people in my life that were like that. And I admired it. Like my my next door neighbor, Jazz. You feel me? Uh, He's a minister. That would be a good person having a podcast. He's super dope. Young minister. uh, Fitness. Like it's crazy. But the way that he carries himself, the way that he has conversations, that's what I want to be. Mm. You know, and it's always about overflowing to come through dripping. Yeah. <laughs> Wherever I go, I'm dripping. Yeah. Well, I ain't I, talking about swag. I'm talking, yeah. about, I'm talking about spirituality. <laughs> well, I want to uh, mirror it back to you. I, you are living into that persona. You are living into it in such a powerful way. It is immediate to see we saw it on charlotte street we are i was gonna say i'm like we we felt that yeah (laughs) we're certain of it now with a uh, certainty that is unparalleled thank you for overflowing uh (laughs) for the last hour we're gonna well i have to add the word of the year thing is something that tony and i've been doing for the past couple of years and it works really well for us powerful yeah as like a as a north star of sorts and then you you so you know amp you, it's a word, and then you turn it into a B statement, which you are. I want to be overflowing mm-hmm. with. Uh, so we're, we're, we are very much aligned in in the way that I think we try and think about things. Yeah. Um, I think that we now transition to a couple of our like more typical questions, less about your career, less about the work. Um, standard. Every single episode, we ask if Sarah and I had a magic wand or our community or listeners had a magic wand, what would be the ask that you would make just today? But what is the ask that you would make given any kind of genie in a bottle kind of response? We can, we can make it. So magic wand, magic wand. We got eyes closed, deep thought. Yeah. I want to say it will have to do with health care, maybe free health care. And it's it's really because of I've lost some friends in recovery since I've been because I'm active in the recovery community. Mm-hmm. I'm not I don't just talk like I go to meetings. I've sponsored people and I've several people have died. And I, and I also know some people that just couldn't afford treatment, you know, because I, I do groups and stuff like that at some places that, you know, they take insurance. and They have amazing. It's amazing treatment. But, like, there's a lot of people that don't have insurance. And even if they do have insurance, it doesn't cover that type of treatment. Mm-hmm. So if there was some type of way to have an impact on health care to be free for everyone, and then people would be able to get the needed treatment that they that they need. And I'm just speaking from a substance use disorder mm-hmm. standpoint. Now, for the people that don't take the treatment and don't choose to, they don't make the decision to go to treatment, then may the prison save their life the way it did mine. 
You know what I'm saying? Because I want everybody to live and I want everybody to change and, and get close to God and be disciples and overflow with me. We just make a whole flood. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But like in order for people that have substance use disorder to change, they need some type of treatment, effective long term treatment with licensed professionals. You know, and what you see that at is places that take t- take insurance for the most part. So if the wine was waived to get that health, that's that's what I'm looking at right now. Dang. Sure, that uh, that hits close to home, and we we love that as a wish. Yeah, here's to that coming true in some ways. Um, another question for you is: we do a word association, so we're going to say Asheville and the word community. What does that? Sh- what what shows up in your mind when I say Asheville community? Hell, these days breweries, uh, <laughs> breweries and and art. <laughs> Um, we have a lot of recovery here. Mm. We have we have strong recovery here, big recovery community here. Yeah. So thinking of Asheville, I definitely think recovery, tourism, imp- a lot of implants. Um, it's all we, good. We raise our hand. <laughs> I mean, I'm implantish. You know, I wasn't born here, mm-hmm. but I've been here since a young age. You know, my dad moved up here. He's a veteran. He came up here at the VA hospital mm-hmm. and started his life, got his life together and everything. And then I moved up here with him because I was getting in trouble down there but uh, in Hickory. But uh, so I'm implant-ish. I've never fit in anywhere I went. And that's that's a big part of my substance use story. Um it's acting out, never fitting in, just wanting to belong, just wanting to be a part of something. That's always been my thing. And, you know, I, I'm like, where am I from? You know, I got North Carolina tatted on my forearm. But, like, sometimes I hear people talk about being natives of Asheville, and, it, and I feel excluded from the conversation because I wasn't born here. Mm. Um, I lived in Shelby for a little bit, Shelby, North Carolina. Lived in um, Hickory for a little bit, and then the rest of the time in Asheville. Where where were you born? Uh, uh, Rutherford County, Forest City, North Carolina, not too far from here. Yep. Yep. It's about an hour. It's a change from here. Um, I'm I'm wondering, because that's interesting. So we we feel like we've been welcomed in Asheville in a way that we to say are grateful for is probably some wild understatement. But we've hmm. Um, how to pose this, right? So we've shown up and in search of community, we've went ahead and and sort of built one. Um, And we have this great platform, which is this podcast. And it's like, without the podcast, I don't know if the three of us spend an hour and a half Mm-hmm. In a, in a room talking yeah. to to one another, and that's with every guest that we've had so far. It, yeah. At best, you might have had like a couple minutes at a cafe, mm-hmm. or we got connected through a friend. How did we make the friend? I don't know. Mm-hmm. And so, I'm wondering if, um, well, I, what I want to say to you, sir, I guess, is that you might not have been born here, but what I'm seeing you do is create. Like you're creating community. Yeah. You are serving in a way that is so powerful that I don't, no one can care where you're from <laughs> with the way that you're showing up yeah. and serving the place that you're in. And it's something that Sarah and I have, um, you know, when we lived in Brooklyn, it was this really, uh, it was a thing that we spent a lot of time talking about and trying to act on was that we were in a place that was, inherently transient right like mm-hmm. new york is n- almost no one's from new york our neighborhood of bedside was a historically black neighborhood is a historically black neighborhood is um a place where there are there is there was lasting communities and mm-hmm. and are and and the the process of being part of change there but not wanting to be transient and trying to mm-hmm. be of value and leave it better than we found it um I, what I, what I try, what we're trying to live into is like, can we, if we only go this way once, mm-hmm. can we leave it better than we found it? And I think that you have done the work to already leave this place better than you found it. We are aspirationally working to leave this place better than we found it. Um, so I want to include you into the the heart, the core of the Asheville that we are learning to love yeah. and like being welcomed into. And I just want to take a moment and just say that out loud to you. You are Asheville to me. 
I know that's dope. I love that. I mean, as far as connecting with people, man, um, a lot of my friends are are in recovery or church. Like, I go to Elevation Church. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, that's dope. 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 Yeah, and you have opportunities to serve. Like a lot of people make friends from volunteering. A lot of people make friends from uh, volunteering and stuff like that. So that's been a way for me to make new friends was at church. Because I had a different, I mean, before I went to prison, I had, it was a different group of friends. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't, I don't really don't hang with, I don't, not really, I don't hang with none of the people I used to hang with. Yeah. You know, now I have a couple of people that have changed their life around. And they're now doing work like me, like serving the the returning citizens or the people with substance use. You know, shout out to my boy uh uh Gritty, Ryan, and shout out to a guy that works with me now, Adrian. You know, we was we grew up together, you know what I'm saying? And he he works with me now doing this work. But like um but as far as like, you know, the old friends I used to hang out with it, it if unless there's a behavioral change, I got to be careful. Mm-hmm. Cuz if you're so proud in your destructive patterns, then you will tempt me to go back to the destructive patterns before I'll be able to convince you to change. And I've learned that because since I've been out, I was still trying to kind of ride the fence and hang around certain people. And then they might be blowing a fat blunt, you know what I'm saying? And I'm in there in recovery, Mr. Mister Recovery here, and it's smelling so good. <laughs> you know, so I had to be careful with hanging with people that weren't into those old, like in that old lifestyle, and I had to distance myself. And it hurt. But change is not comfortable, mm-hmm. right? Going back to that, like, who said change was supposed to be comfortable? So um, as far as community is concerned, welcome. And I'm glad you said that, bro, because, uh, you know, I, I really don't plan on leaving. We just, I'm a first-time homeowner, and I ain't planning on leaving Asheville, period. Like, I'm planning on being here. You know, now, if they Van Jones hit me up and he got something for me in Washington, D.C., paying some good enough money to take care of my family and, and let my wife work part time or something or go be a, a model or something, you know, and, and I got enough money to take care of the whole family. I'll go. I'll move to D.C. But other than that, I ain't going nowhere. I'll be right here in my mountains. You mm-hmm. feel me? Yeah. Right here. Going to City Bakery, getting me a triple triple shot espresso, getting turned up doing work. Yeah, I'll be right here. Praising God at Elevation Church, Asheville. You know, no need to leave. I mean, people be talking about the amount of black people we have here. We got some black people here. He's got, I mean, we we there. Like they're not walking around downtown shopping at uh, uh what's the name of that store? The the outside store that sell the Nalgene bottles. Uh, uh yeah. Mass? Uh, no. Well, Mass General. Mass. Store. Yeah. I mean, we ain't hanging out downtown, going to the Marble Slab. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're here. We're different places. We're around. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh. So people say they always laugh because gentrification did hit us though. It hit and it has hit other cities too. It, it hit us hard. Yeah. But there are black people. We just spread out, you know. You know, and I ain't going nowhere. I'm one of the ones. I'm, I'm telling you, I ain't going nowhere unless they call me to Washington. <laughs> like, well, I mean, uh, <laughs> you might be calling your shot. I just it, it seems like <laughs> seems like that. Uh, it, it's it's more than possible. Um, well, One, I mean, for, first of all, congratulations yeah. on the home. Yeah. That's oh, really exciting. You. We're looking to buy a house this year, so that's that's on our minds a lot, and I can yeah. imagine that's a huge we life change. You're going to do it in Asheville. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hopefully. Well, yeah. yeah, we we don't know what we don't know about the process. We're uh, just getting started. Just very, very early, but... Uh, I got a real is... estate agent for you. Shout out to Rita Lee. <laughs> <laughs> She a beast. She fought for our land, and my mama was dying. I could do a whole podcast on Rita by herself. Wow. I'm talking about. So me and my wife, we were searching, and we're very religious, and we're trying to find a home and stuff like that. We had got the loan, and so we found some land, and then they didn't want to do easements, and and then the people that owned the land was playing around and stuff like that. And she came in like a wrecking ball, and my mama was dying at this point in time, like she was in end of life care that I was doing overprotective, right? Didn't even get a CNA. I did everything. I was there. I can show you the alarms on my phone still: med call alarm, Haldol alarm, morphine alarm, mental health nap. You know what I'm saying? Like that, those are my alarms. But anyway. Um, meanwhile, Rita, she would call and she had this, this like this way of real estate signatures you can do. They can email you and you can sign, just giving her permission to do stuff. And she fought for our land, like straight up. And, um, that's how we got the acre we got in Oakley. 
for a decent price. <laughs> you know, but um, Rita Lee with Exit Realty or something like that. Wow. Dang. Thank you, Rita. Um, so you, you've been here how many years in Nashville? Have you lived in Nashville? Since eighth grade. Okay. Yeah, I came over yeah. here to start going to uh, Reynolds Middle School. And uh, and then I stayed with my daddy. Now I did leave briefly and go to Hickory in two thousand mm-hmm. in my senior year because I was mm-hmm. getting out of hand. And my daddy sent me back to stay with my mama. He was like, "You ain't gonna bring that hoodlum stuff up here." And so and then I went back to uh, Hickory and got immediately got in trouble. But I, I did. I dropped out of high school, came, but my mama made me go back. She was like, "You ain't gonna be staying in my house selling that mess. You either gonna work or go to school." So I went back and I I finished my uh, high school. And uh, then I caught some charges. And so when I went, did my time, when I got out, I moved back with my daddy in 2003. It was the end of 2003. So um, so I was gone probably like, t- so from the eighth grade into the 12th grade, and then minus two years. And then I came back and been here ever since. Okay. Minus the, you know, the state funded vacation. I feel like that was a little math equation right there. <laughs> in, the, in the video version of this soundbite, yeah. there was a math yeah. happening. So hold on. So 99, 98. So 98 middle school. 98 to 2002 is four. Hold on. Two. Yeah, four. Four, four years. And then uh, left. For two, came back in 03, been here ever since 03 is 2020. So 17 plus four, that's 21. 21 minus three, 21 minus three just call it three, is uh, 18, about 18 years. Okay. okay. So yeah. you you know, what I'm trying to get is you know Asheville yeah. Oh, yeah. pretty well. I, I'm wondering what kind of things do you like to do in Asheville when you're not working? If there is that time. I, like, I mean, <laughs> I like church. I like to work out. Mm-hmm. I like to eat ice cream. I love ice cream, especially because I'm pregnant. My wife pregnant, and I'm pregnant. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we both pregnant. That's what they always say. Like I yeah. eat ice cream. I eat ice cream before dinner. Hell, what kind I don't of ice cream? Damn. Like I've been. I learned my white rights. I mm-hmm. earned my rights. See, mm-hmm. I like ice cream from. Uh, I like Ultimate Ice Cream, mm-hmm. and they get uh, some of their dairy from my man Nathan Ramsey. Got a dairy farm, and so shout out to Nathan Ramsey. Uh, he's the chair of the Workforce Development Board. Solid guy, but uh, but I like going there. But as far as flavors, they got a birthday cake remix at um, Cold Stone Creamery. Mm-hmm. Good gracious. And they got that brownie in there with them birthday sprinkles. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I don't care. Hey, I'm telling you, because I'm pregnant now with my wife. I'm eating every. Matter of fact, I don't know what I'm going to eat for lunch. I'm uh, what y'all eat? what y'all got for lunch going on? With no plans. <laughs> Leftovers. <Yeah. laughs> Nothing exciting. Yeah, okay. I'm going to get something drive through. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cause I gotta go. I can go get my hair. Yeah, you got a haircut coming up yeah. soon. We got it. So, um, how about like uh, favorite? If you had friends visiting from town or, or uh, from out of town, or if you're you're doing a grand tour, let's say, of Asheville, what places land high on that tour? Any type. Well, I mean, get them on a trolley ride. That could be like somebody that's like a history buff. It would be interesting. I know one thing I learned about. It was some stuff they did on Montfort with some type of sickness and people would sleep on the porches and stuff like that. Something tuberculosis, maybe. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. Uh, but like uh, I did that when I was in leadership Asheville, they put us on a trolley ride. But um, I say get on a trolley, Biltmore, ha- but of course Biltmore House. You know, of course Biltmore House. Um, take go get some wings from the social on a Tuesday night. The social, their wings are lit. Um, the social. And social, it's in East Asheville. Okay, really good wing. They have a wing night, you know. You got to get them in increments of four, and you can't take none out. So you know, and they're like fifty nine cent. Um, I'm trying to think of what else, what else I would want them to do. Come to Elevation Church Asheville, Amen. See me on a Sunday. Um, they probably want to go to the Nature Center. I mean, I'm not into the hiking and all that kind of stuff. Hiking and, and canoeing in the South Ranch Broad and all that. No. No, that's not my jam. But if that is their jam, then of course I'll have them going there. And then I might, you know, get them if they want to go check out the breweries. I know New Belgium is, they have like a pretty unique atmosphere over there. And yeah, so tell them to go get drunk and call the Uber. Don't drink and drive. You end up locked up in Asheville and on my caseload. <laughs> you end up hitting me up for services. <laughs> oh, man. That's fantastic. Um, what else was it? What else is on our list of? We always ask questions. 
Hmm. I mean, it's just, it's a magic wand. It's community. It's um, the 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 absolute last question is where do we find you on the internet? Is there anything we want to throw in before that? Is there anything that we've missed that you hoped that you to talk to about? Cover? Yeah. Uh, no, nah, I mean a lot of topics that I had because I can get long winded because I'm a motivational speaker anyway and a storyteller, so like I get long winded. I mean, I got a pretty interesting love story, like how me and my wife ended up uh, together. It's pretty interesting. Shout out to my Barbie. Um, which one in in the photos? Yeah, which one's your wife? That's her right there. Mhm. Mhm. And then right behind you is me and her action figures. We got some action figures oh, made. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> Mister Incredible! I love it. Yeah, yeah. She's supposed to be right on out because I I know. I understand that I'm wired in some type of way. It it is it is what it is. Like especially being excited about like right now I'm so excited just talking about the work and some of the questions you asked me like me verbalizing it reminded me about the perseverance and the faith in the process. So how can I not get excited about that on a Friday? You know, before I go to the MLK breakfast tomorrow morning, right? How can I not be excited? So some of the stuff that we talked about was like reminders for myself, like, bro, it's really good right now. And it's re- watch out for burnout. But but, you know, it's really good right now. And so, like, I'm lit. I love that. Yeah, I'm lit. Perfect. All right. So then how uh, to our audience that that listened, wants to support, how do they find you on the Internet? Hit me on LinkedIn right now, Philip Cooper 1L. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm fasting from Facebook. My pastor, shout out to Pastor Brennan. She took like a, a, a fast from social media, so I followed her lead. And so I'm not on Facebook, but I'm usually super active on Facebook, LinkedIn, Snapchat, uh, Philip Cooper, Change Agent Cooper. Um, on Sna- uh, on Instagram and Facebook, I have a Change Agent Cooper page, and I'm usually on there. I'll be back mid February. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you want to reach me, um, you interested in in contributing to the cause as far as returning citizen affairs, you know, um, just hit hit Tony up. He'll figure out a way for us to sit down and have coffee at a uh, at City Bakery for sure. Or Ultra, I like Ultra. That's Ultra's why, I, good. yeah, I love Ultra. Cool. High five, mm-hmm. high five, and the high five certified living wage with Just Economics. Shout out to High Five. Let me get a (laughs) t-shirt. So, uh, listening audience, if if Making It in Asheville has uh, (laughs) t-shirts, when you listen to this episode at some point in the future, it's because we were told that we need to get some t-shirts that we can get uh, (laughs) so Philip can rock it in town. And um, I was one of the... Man, I, you're absolutely right. Like you're wearing a No Evil Food shirt, right? You had a, a East Fork shirt, and it is. It's a conversation starter. It's an opportunity for you to tell yeah. some of the stories that you tell, which are so powerful and meaningful, and and are a part of the light that you're shining. And so, yeah. we're gonna get you a shirt, sir. Yeah, man, we're gonna that figure that out because it's real. And I know a lot of people that will probably buy it because it's making a statement. Like, even for me, like, to, to wear that shirt, I would be making a statement like, okay, you gentrifying, but I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to get this bread, and I'm going to survive in my town. You feel me? So, making it in Asheville. Yeah, yeah. It's a st- ha- I'll hashtag it. Well, if you ain't we start hashtagging it on some of them uh, uh, inspirational posts. Let's making it, it in Please Asheville. Do. You know, the black godfather. Amen. <laughs> I seen that movie. It did something for me, though, when I seen it. Because it was about him. He was just a connector. You know what I'm saying? And he's just connected his way all the way to the presidential office. Wow. You know what I'm saying? In there with the president. All from connecting in authentic relationships. Because I don't know how to be fake. Like, I don't. I don't know how to be anything else. Like, that. for a long time in my life, I tried to wear a mask. And it was so uncomfortable. It was so tired. It was draining to have to wear a mask. So, when I started using drugs, that's that was the answer. Because when I started using drugs, I ain't care what nobody think. So that was like the answer to all my uncomfortable emotions, right? Mm. So whenever whenever I, I got my life right and got clean and sober, gave my life to Christ, and I started living my life, I started noticing like, like, bro, you solid. Just be you. Be authentic. Be be the same person all the time. Integrity. Mm. And it started working. You know what I'm saying? So, hey, this me. You know? And people that want to connect with me, they connect with me because, because of who I am. And what better way to connect with people than being the authentic self? And the next thing you know, you start having all these people you cool with that want to commit to the cause, and that's how I skill blew up. Not trying to be cocky, because somebody said I was arrogant. <laughs> somebody. Like, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Not no. sorry. I ain't sorry. Yeah. I ain't uh, sorry. I hope you hear the podcast. I ain't sorry. 
If I if I'm arrogant, I'm co- I'm, I'm cocky because there was there was programs in place that could have been doing what I was doing, and they didn't want to listen to my ideas. And when I started doing them, it started getting some momentum and 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 recognized outside the the city and started getting funding from outside the area. So I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, not sorry. Yeah, I got cocky. Because I ended up being the gap filler in the bridge when I had these ideas and had to sit in meetings and look crazy with my ideas and nobody wanted to listen. No, wait, no, sorry, no, Philip, I don't know about that. Okay, I'll do it myself. i do it myself. Hurt. So, yeah, it made me a little cocky, yeah. a little cocky. Lord, forgive me for my cockiness. But whoever the person is is saying I'm arrogant, I'm not asking for your forgiveness. And, and that, is, that is one person and that's almost always a them thing. <laughs> that's that's the thing that we're, what we're realizing is that that's a them thing yeah. right like we know the intention that we're bringing to our work yeah. i know i know the intention that you're bringing to yeah. your work someone's got something to say like if if it's constructive if it adds value mm-hmm. if it helps you in like like your mentors are saying not this meeting yeah right like that's helpful yeah mm-hmm. that's a helpful way to give feedback yeah. or or advice if it's not helpful, that's a them thing. Yeah, that's a them thing. That's a them thing. And so uh allow us to say keep keep being cocky. Keep being whatever whatever is you. Yo, and whatever. if someone defines <laughs> yeah. that as cocky, that's a that's a them thing. <laughs> keep being go. whatever is you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us today. Yeah, thank you for coming through, man. Allowing me to, to share my, my story. And that was episode forty four with Philip Cooper, and I, I mean, I am like, a, I'm on an 11. I can't hear Philip. I can't be around him. I can't watch his Instagram uh, stories and, and, and posts and not be at an 11. I am so glad that we met on Charlotte Street by chance and happened to have this uh, conversation and create the possibility for all of the good that we might do together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there were a lot of things we mentioned mm-hmm. in this episode. Um, shout outs. There were a lot of shout outs. We tried to ca- we yeah. tried to catch all of the shout outs, uh, and and it was a lot. And so we might have missed some, but we tried to catch all of them, and they would be in the show notes page. Yeah, exactly. So if you want to learn more about how you can connect with Philip himself, you want to learn more about the organizations that he mentions in the episode, um, all of that is listed on the show notes page. Just go to makingitinashville.com forward slash zero four four. You'll find all sorts of interesting tidbits there. Perfect. And if uh, you enjoyed this episode and, and, any episode, but especially this episode, mm-hmm. please take a moment if you can, if it's uh, accessible to you. We try to have it in all of the uh, possible ways that a player might play this episode. A link to Apple Podcasts. If you can throw five stars up or take a moment more and write a short review, that means the world to us. It makes such a difference when this episode is able to get discovered on the platforms. And so when people search, Asheville or when they search Philip Cooper like it'll show up with more likes and more reviews and so if you do take a moment to do that we are wildly uh, grateful and very much appreciative thank you definitely and don't forget to subscribe so if you want to be the first to hear about new episodes um, subscribe on whichever podcast player you prefer to use and you'll get notifications when new episodes come out please also subscribe to our newsletter Um, that is probably the easiest way that you're going to hear about not only new episodes when they come out we send out an announcement email when when there is a new episode plus a follow-up email with more context about the episode Um, things like behind the scenes stuff that we don't always talk about in the actual podcast um but we also send out information about upcoming events so you'll be the first to hear about um our monday maker mixer events uh, new workshops uh, and more so you can subscribe to our newsletter by going to making it in nashville.com forward slash subscribe and we just want to take a moment again to uh Thank our Making It Creative uh, marketing agency. Really the reason why we are able to put as much time and intention into this podcast is because that business has supported us uh, for the last nine months and and for the future, foreseeable future. And so, uh, again, the idea here is that we take businesses, we work with them to identify their story, 
whichever is most powerful. And then we look for the largest levers to help drive business. And so sometimes that looks like social media marketing, but that happens way later. We try to think about email marketing, website communication, sales communication, all sorts of, uh, there are all sorts of ways to work with businesses. If you are interested in working with us to, to see if there is a fit, please visit makingitcreative.com. And, uh, you know, there's a quick survey there. Let us know that you stopped by, and we look forward to hearing more about what you're working on. And finally, two more things. If you would like to nominate a guest or you yourself would like to be on the podcast, uh, you can nominate them by filling out a very short form at makingitinashville.com forward slash podcast. Uh, we're always looking for new guests. We're planning out the year's worth of podcast. Uh, we release a new episode every week. So there is lots to talk about and to cover. And one last thing, little ad, and we've never talked about this before, but we are looking for sponsorships of mm. the podcast. So if you are a business and you think that um, our audience could be a good fit uh, for you to to reach, please reach out. We are starting to think about ads, think about sponsorships and ways to partner with local businesses um, to, to reach a very interesting audience. Yeah. And just to kind of double underline that uh, for someone who is listening who's maybe not a sponsor, um, the idea is that anything that we'd support or put into an episode is something that we really believe in, is something that we use and something that we can stand by. Um, and if and when we start doing ads that aren't about making it creative, we, our intention is that they will be very fun and interesting and exciting and worth listening to um, and not something that you would necessarily want to skip. So just because we're saying, hey, uh, we're thinking about sponsorships. Don't say we're selling out. We're trying to add value to you, dear listener and friend, um, and and make this thing even more sustainable. So, uh, yes, 2020 has a lot of good in store. Part of it, uh, we're open to allowing that good to be sponsorships to this podcast. So, 44 episodes in. Uh, so, so, so much more exciting content coming down the pike. Uh, if you haven't already listened to the entire archive, uh, please start at episode one, which and you'll hear the difference <laughs> in audio quality from one to 44. But um, just thank you. Thank you, listener, for, for making it this far in this episode. Thank you for supporting us with the likes and the shares and the five stars and the reviews and, the, and just you know, coming to the events. It's so crazy. We're having this really crazy kind of influx period in our personal lives, in our relationship with Asheville. And this podcast has really made a lot of the best parts possible. So again, just thank you. Episode 44 is now over. Uh, and we Tony, will, stop talking. <laughs> we will see you in episode 45. Sarah, we did it. High, High five. five.